Randy Mosher joins me this week to discuss New England IPAs and innovations in hop techniques. This is Beersmith Podcast number 169. This is Beersmith Podcast number 169, and it's early April 2018. This week, Randy Mosher joins me to discuss New England IPAs and hop techniques. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running an amazing deal right now. Get 20% off your subscription when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2018. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers, and you can read my new column called Ask the Experts. Take advantage of their special deal when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2018 at BEERANDBREWING.COM. Again, that's BEERANDBREWING.COM. And also the new BrewVision Thermometer from Blickman Engineering. This interactive wireless digital thermometer connects right to your iPhone or iPad and lets you remotely monitor and record temperatures. You can download your recipes right from the BeerSmith cloud and set updates and alerts as you brew. Get the BrewVision Bluetooth thermometer today. Another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, BeerSmith Mobile, the mobile version of BeerSmith, is a perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. It includes all the tools you need to create recipes on the go, share them with friends, and act as a pocket brew timer. Check out BeerSmith Mobile at beersmith.com slash mobile or on the Google Play, iTunes, or Amazon app stores. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Randy Mosher. Randy is the author of many of my favorite homebrewing books, including Mastering Homebrew, Radical Brewing, and Tasting Beer. Randy is also a faculty member at the Siebel Institute and partner in two Chicago area breweries, Five Rabbit and Forbidden Root. And I, I want to mention your website also at uh, randymosher.com, right, Randy? Yep, thanks, Brad. Yeah, great to be here. Always uh, always good having a conversation. Yeah. It is always a pleasure to have you back. And um, I understand you've been traveling recently. Yeah, I just spent almost three weeks in New Zealand, uh, part, part vacation and part uh, homebrew conference and uh, a little bit of uh, sensory training and things like that at some breweries. So it was uh, pretty fun, pretty fun and, and kind of interesting to see what's going on in the beer scene right now. So what is uh, what is happening down there? Well, they got about 200 breweries or a little more than that uh, for a population, I think, of about four and a half million or a little more than that. Uh, so it's starting to get a bit crowded down there as far as the market. They're still pretty much on the old school IPA, you know, the kind of uh, 40 to 60 Lovabon crystal malt heavy kind of, uh, you know, more or less in the Sierra Nevada uh, mold. And so uh, that's there's still a lot of sameness about a lot of the things. Of course, they have the really great hops down there, but I have to report that they don't have that much easier time getting a hold of them than we do uh, because the international prices for those are so high that they tend to... Uh, ship a lot of them out uh, despite the local needs. So uh, every, I guess everybody on the planet is uh, dying to get their hands on some Nelson Salvans and uh, Motuecas. So they, uh, they must uh, import hops then, right? Oh, yeah. So they use a lot of West Coast hops and they use European noble hops. And, you know, hop, hop business has always been very international. So uh, despite the fact that they have these fabulous varieties down there, uh, they use a lot of uh, like West Coast hops and things like that. Uh, the, the interesting thing was that there, there's a hop down there called Rewaka that is way in demand there and very much valued by brewers and consumers alike. And it's interesting that that hop, you can get it here kind of, but it's never been one that's really broken through like the Motueka and the Nelson Sullivan and, and the Australian Galaxy and some of those other ones. So it's just interesting that for whatever reason, that was never really caught fire here. But it's uh, very popular down there, huh? Very popular, very much prized. It has a real nice, real bright kind of um, sort of tropic, well, definitely tropical kind of, I would describe it maybe as a bit passion fruity, um, but a really pleasant hop. Had you hit any interesting breweries while you were there? Yeah, the one that the one that really uh, was pretty impressive to me, the most impressive one, was uh, a brewery called uh, Garage Project. We would say garage, but uh, it was started in an old auto repair garage in uh, Wellington, not too far from downtown. And it, they've got a whole sour program in a separate building. Uh, they're doing New England's. They're doing a lot of crazy things. They even had a, a beer that was tomato, and I think it might have been 
feijoa, which is a uh, a relative of guava from Brazil that also grows in New Zealand that has a kind of an interesting uh, guava, passion fruity kind of tropical flavor. So, uh, and a lot of acidity. So they're doing some really creative stuff. They got great labels. And I mean, you could pick them up, plop them down in, in any hip neighborhood in the United States and they'd be like the coolest thing going. So, nice. so it's pretty, they're a fun bunch. Well, um, today you wanted to talk about New England IPAs and also uh, some hop biotransformations, which I'm very interested in. Um, but let's start with the nitty gritty. Why do so many people hate the uh, New England IPA style? <laughs> I don't know. It's funny because uh, I guess it's part of it's just the change is hard. And and I know the, the, the people have expressed to me that that they feel like the brewers who are doing this are actually lazy somehow for forgetting to bother to filter or giving the beer adequate time. Um, you know, I I've, don't know. I've, I've been to plenty of breweries that don't do that, you know? Yeah. We don't do that in any of our beers at either breweries. I mean, we give them enough time, but we don't, we don't filter just because we don't really feel that we, we have the need to, and it adds a, a step and complication and expense. And ultimately it's hard to filter without it actually removing some things in the beer that you do want there. So, so we found, we can make perfectly fine, clear beers without it. But, uh, you know, I don't know. It's um, There's a very strong reaction to the New Englands. My first experience wasn't very good, I have to say, mm -hmm. uh, um, that somebody shoved a beer in my – it was the last beer of Craft Beer Conference two or three years ago, and it was very yeasty and kind of and very murky looking. When when the beers get a little dark in color, they get really unappetizing and, and dirty looking. Uh, so you have to keep them pale. So – you know, and that was my first exposure, and I'm like, yeah, this is kind of yucky. And uh, eventually, our sales manager had been traveling, traveling at Forbidden Root, had been traveling back and forth to uh, New England a lot, to Boston specifically. And so every time he came back, he was bringing home two or three of those. And we went through them, and we found a lot that we didn't really care all that much about. But we found a few that we really thought were pretty interesting, and we could see that there was some potential there uh, to work with the style. And, and for me personally, I've always loved wheat beer, and, and these beers are like we we make them. They're half unmalted adjuncts, uh, so that fits r w w right with something I already like. And they have a huge amount of hop aroma and not that much bitterness. And also, the hop aroma tends to be very much in the elegant, fruity, um, little bit of citrus uh, kind of direction, without too much of that pungent floral or or piney or dank or resiny kind of aromas. And that for me suits my palate better anyway. So, so it wasn't a big, you know, it wasn't a big stretch once we kind of figured out what the style was all about and how to start attacking it. Um, we jumped on board and, mm. uh, it's been a lot of fun. What were some of the commercial examples that you enjoyed? Uh, the, um, I think the ones that really impressed us most and first were Trillium, mm -hmm. which is I believe, outside of Boston or in the Boston area. Um, we had some of the ones from, uh, in Connecticut, uh, two roads, I think it is. Um, so th those were pretty nice. Um, uh, you know, so, th so there's, there were definitely some that impressed us. Some of them, I think, you know, those are beer, those are beers that need to be reasonably fresh. Uh, the, the, fa the fan base of it has this insistence that they need to be less than a, about two or three weeks old, which I, we think is a little bit overstated, but, uh, definitely, uh, they fit like any hoppy beer, they fade with age. And, and because there's so much aroma, the aroma does fall off within, uh, say, a month or so. We had uh, Michael Tonsmeyer on about, I can't remember, six or eight weeks ago talking mm -hmm. about this particular style. But uh, since you wrote the taste book, I thought maybe I'd get your take on, uh, you know, how do you define the style? What does it actually taste like? Well, in terms of, of gravity, they pretty much follow the classifications of pale ale, um, uh, IPA, double IPA, and then to go back to the other end, session IPA. And we've done a couple of triples too. So in terms of alcohol, original gravity is pretty much the same thing. Uh, the key differences are very high adjunct content. The beers we brew at Forbidden Root are about 50% adjunct. Um, we did one that had 30% rye in it, which is a pretty high amount of rye, kind of a difficult grain to deal with uh, in the louder ton. And uh, we think that very high amount of wheat and or oats and or uh, rye, we've used flake barley also in it, uh, that those unmalted adjuncts bring a lot of the uh, glucosans and pentasans, glucans and pentasans that give those beers their really glutinous, creamy kind of texture. So there's one super important aspect of it. Second important aspect of it is that there's very little kettle hopping. 
We only kettle hop to the extent that we think we need to in order to encourage coagulation of some of the longer proteins that are not going to be beneficial in terms of body or head retention or that mouthfeel, but mm -hmm. would uh, precipitate out anyway and just fall out and create sludge in the bottom of the, of the uh, uh, can. So we don't really want to encourage that. And um, so that's uh, uh, so that creamy texture is super important for us and really a key aspect of the, of the, of the style. And then, um, well, then the hop, so. So you mentioned, hop, you mentioned you don't kettle hop. You must uh, hop in the whirlpool or, or dry hop. Yeah. So we do, we do throw a pinch in the kettle just for, to help coagulation. And then we put a charge in the, in the whirlpool. That is our, we kind of sometimes calculate it. We sometimes don't. Uh, but that is just basically uh, start to build some flavor in there. Uh, we're getting some bitterness out of it, you know, in a commercial brewery, you you may get somewhere between 18 and 25 or 30 percent utilization in that whirlpool stage because it's a larger vat, it's deeper, you've got a higher boiling temperature or higher one even once you turn off the boil, um, it's a higher temperature down at the bottom of the tank, so you get a little better utilization than you would in a homebrew setup. Uh, but uh, I would say sort of minimal bittering, and then um, uh, then the next. The next thing is, and this is again one of the key differentiators, is that we dry hop during high croissant. So we'll typically come in with a small dry hop charge uh, on day two after the beers uh, started to ferment and it's maybe, I don't know, a third to a half of, of the way towards its um, complete fermentation. We've even done some where we put the hops right in with the yeast. But it's my understanding that that can be a bit of a problem that, that by the book anyway, some of those hop compounds can kind of glom onto the yeast and slow them down a little bit so that it's recommended that you get, uh, at least get the, let the yeast get going and multiply up. And, yeah. Cause uh, hops obviously a preservative, right? So it's probably going to, well, probably going to inhibit fermentation early, right? Uh, you know, they're specifically inhibitory towards the gram. I think it's the gram negative, which are the uh, lactobacillus and pediococcus strains. Yeah. That's why they're in, that's why they're in beer. So they're not inhibitory on, on yeast. Okay. Per se. But they, in large amounts, you know, you're putting in a lot of raw material that has these sort of resiny things. I have heard that that stuff actually can kind of get on the cells and sort of coat the cells and make it a little more difficult for the cells to to do their work. I don't I don't have definitive science on it, mm -hmm. but we find that we get good we get good yeast activity and that biotransformation, which starts to happen at that point uh, if we add it, like I said, about a third to a half way through um, attenuation. And we're going to, I want to get into the biotransformations yeah. in detail in a minute or two, but um, yeah. I just want to go back for a minute. Can you go back and, and describe the sensory? Uh, what does it taste like? Yeah. So sensory, first thing you notice obviously is this hazy appearance, really kind of almost a fine milkiness to it. Really, literally, if you put a glass of orange juice on the table, there's your standard visually, right? So that look at that kind of warmish color, not too dark, pretty pretty opaque uh, milkiness, kind of a fine milkiness, not a sludgy, grungy dirtiness, but a, it's supposed a to be fluffy of, and puffy, right? Well, it's supposed to be pleasant appearing, and when the when those beers are too dark, if you use too much dark or malts in them, they uh, they get really, really dark. Uh, we attempted to make a red one. Um, I didn't, wasn't 100% sure it was a good idea at the time. And once we had the beer in the tanks, everybody's like, oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't have done that because it looked like unholy hell. And we had a hard time selling it because it just looked so bad. It tasted great, but uh, it just was really so unappetizing. It just really looked like a freshly poured glass of mud. So, um, so, in so blood that's beer, huh? You get a nice head on them, you know, hops are foam positive, so you definitely get a really nice head on them. And, um, you know, when you hold the glass up to your nose, it, they are, if you never had one, if you get one that really has the proper amount of hops in the dry hops, they're just an overwhelming smack of hops in your face. They really have a huge fresh hop note to them. Uh, when they're really young, they really give off a little bit of that smell that homebrewers know that that's that hops in the kettle that can be kind of, uh, you know, like my wife thinks that's unpleasant, you know, because it's just a little too raw and too green. Mm -hmm. uh, when they're when they're like really freshly packaged, uh, you know, maybe two weeks two weeks after brewing, after brew day, they can still retain a bit of that really just super green, super fresh hop thing. That that goes away, and in my opinion, uh, that's not the best aspect of it. But but as I said, 
you're looking for hops that have some sort of um, fruity characteristics, whether it's in uh, sort of pear, apricot, stone fruit, uh, uh, aromas like that, or hops that from specifically like the New Zealand hops that really are pretty strong in, in passion fruit and uh, guava, mango, pineapple, things like that. Uh, we use a lot of uh, um, El Dorado. That's sort of our hop of choice because we all like it just in terms of its character. It has a nice, fresh, pineapple-y kind of note to it, but you can still tell it's hops. Yeah, that's, and, uh, isn't that more of a bittering hop in general, though? Yeah. I don't know what it's for. Yeah. You know, I don't know, but we like it. And it's not that, you know, it's 12 bucks a pound for us. It's not, it's not super expensive. It's not really super hard to get, but we really like the character. Mm. We use some mosaic. We use citra. Um, citra's pretty has been pretty variable. A couple of years ago, there was a lot of onion, um, those um, onion and garlic kind of uh, uh, aromas in it. Um, so it seems to be more affected by harvest, by, by field conditions and harvest conditions, because those are those oniony things are a result of plant stress. Mm -hmm. But, uh, uh, you know, and then if you can get your hands on it, Nelson Salvin and, and uh, Ruwaka and uh, um, uh, uh, Motueka and uh, uh, all those, you know, the New Zealands, the galaxies, great people, you know, consumers are very tuned into hop varieties for this in terms of the market. And, uh, and uh, you know, we'll kind of support them. But when you're putting eight pounds per barrel into a triple IPA and the hops are costing 30 bucks a pound, it's a really tough economic uh, kind of situation. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, pretty, pretty over, over the top. Um, well, what makes it different from, say, a classic IPA, a classic American IPA, or an American pale ale? Well, you know, I think one of the things, it's interesting because things I mean, have been other, happening. Other than obviously it's cloudy, but. Yeah, well, it's it happens to be cloudy, and the cloudiness really we, is partially a result of the very high amount of unmalted adjuncts that always brings a certain amount of haziness, if you think about wit beer. Yeah, a lot of proteins are left in it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and um the other thing is is that um, that there seems to be a chemical reaction that happens when you dry hop during active fermentation that creates a type of very permanent, very fine haze uh, that doesn't really seem to settle out uh, very quickly. So uh, it, it really is that early dry hopping during high croissant that really seems to make the difference in terms of the hazy appearance. And uh, of course, what you're doing is again that biotransform biotransformation in which you're taking some lesser less desirable hop aroma compounds and you're chemically changing them into more desirable hop compounds uh so that's the the beauty and wonder of that um and uh so very cool uh yeah. well let's talk about brewing one starting with the uh, water profile and water chemistry what what kind of water works best for this style well, you want to keep the carbonate. I mean, if you're going by the book, uh, the carbonate should be a below. Uh, the bicarbonate should be below about 70, 75 ppm. Uh, now, in Chicago, we have water that's a little bit harder than that at about 120, and we don't have the facilities to remove all that carbonate. So we just use it as it is, and we find we get very good results. Um, you know, typical shooting for pH of five five or so. We're not looking for anything extreme in terms of pH. So you can either use a little bit of uh, as, uh, lactic acid or phosphoric acid, or I mean, that's typically what brewers do. Uh, you certainly have the ability to add uh, a little bit of a couple percent of sour malt to do that. Uh, the, the biggest difference in terms of water chemistry from a traditional IPA would be that normally traditional IPAs are very much on the Burton on Trent kind of water standard where where they really enjoy the crisp bite of um, calcium sulfate or gypsum to give it that really brisk kind of clean um, edge to the beer and a crisp finish. That's the opposite of what we want in one of these beers, right? So, so the proceed sort of standard practice has been rather than either all sulfate or maybe half sulfate, half calcium chloride to go with, um, uh, about a two-thirds ratio, that is two parts of calcium chloride, which is the brewing salt that's more typically used for lagers, where a smooth, round sort of finish is preferred. Uh, and then the other 35%, 33% would be gypsum. We've even done some with 100% um, calcium sulfate, or I'm sorry, calcium chloride, instead of adding some calcium um, uh, sulfate, but the, and that works fine also. But you just so want to stay 
you try to boost the calcium level by doing that or is that the well, primary? Yeah, I, th I think it's just, uh, you know, a lot of professional brewers don't really necessarily go by the John Palmer book and uh, everybody seems to just sort of add a little bit extra calcium uh, to the mash. You know, you need, I think the textbook on calcium is about 65 ppm. Uh, we should yeah, be but okay. it's, a, it's a pretty wide range if I remember right. Yeah, so minimum minimum 65 is get you enough calcium to do the reaction. But whatever the reason, the standard commercial practice is, is like, oh, let's throw in some gypsum or some calcium chloride or some mixture. And the, the general mixture is uh, two, third, two parts calcium chloride, one part calcium sulfate. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, as you know, I'm not the world's biggest water chemistry nerd, but yeah. uh, we find we get really good practice from that. I will say that when you get up around 100 ppm now – in America, we have this, like, if, if a little is a good thing, a lot must be a lot better. Uh, but with calcium chloride, we find that up at about 100 ppm, we start to really uh, produce, it starts to create a kind of a sharp, minerally, almost metallic kind of flavor. So you want to be sure not to overdo that one. Because a little is a good thing, but a lot is not definitely not a good thing. So Randy, uh, what about the grain bill? What is it? I mentioned, you mentioned you use a lot of adjuncts. We do use a lot of adjuncts. And as you know, over the last probably 10 years or so, we've seen a, a general trend in, in IPAs and, and even pale ales to use less crystal malt, especially less of that 60 and 40 Lavabond uh, crystal, because it, it's a kind of heavy flavor. Uh, I think generally younger uh, drinkers are perceiving that to some degree as kind of boomer beer or dad's beer. You know, it's definitely in that Sierra Nevada, early West Coast uh, kind of mold. And I think that's sort of regarded by the younger drinkers as a little bit kind of outmoded. Um, myself, I've always thought people use a little too much crystal malt, so I'm happy to see it kind of go away. Uh, you will find that those crystal malts, especially in that color range of 40 to 60, uh, are pretty, uh, create a lot of potential for the beer to go stale. Um, so that there is, uh, and they, I mean, on the high end at 60, they can be kind of harsh too. Yeah. Not, they're not everybody's cup of tea. You know, my wife, Nancy really particularly hates that sort of burnt raisin, burnt marshmallow kind of flavor you get in the 60 and 80 lava bonds. They're very heavy flavors. And I, you know, when people started home brewing. The recipe was a can of extract, a pound of crystal. There's your five gallons. And you could throw in three pounds of sugar if you felt like it, you know? Uh, so I, people just became habituated to that homebrew recipe. And then I think it was very hard for people to get away from just the habit of tossing crystal into everything. Uh, we, we, so we, and also, uh, so, so generally but, the uh, IPA, uh, like traditional, uh, traditional IPA is actually made with a hundred percent pale malt, right? Well, yeah, traditionally, but if you look at what pale malt was in the 19th century, it was quite a different thing than what we have today. The yeah. kilning, the kilning um, methods were, were, I mean, it took two days to kill instead of a few hours. That it, We don't know exactly what they were like. We know that they did have um, some, uh, some white malt and they had some slightly darker malt. There was a darker pale ale malt called imperial malt. So there was a number of different malts that were... Um, you know, use. So it's a little bit hard to say the the images of them when you see them in old pictures and things, they look pretty much like the film, uh, the IPAs of today, but uh, the flavor surely would have been quite a bit different, I think. Uh, so, and, and also uh, we are tending to use not a hundred percent pale ale malt. And again, that was sort of the formula pale ale malt plus crystal equals IPA or pale ale. And uh, so we've, we've backed off of that. We have some recipes where we use very little of that, uh, some recipes where we'll use maybe as much as 50%. Um, but we're getting a, a mixture of, of pills malt. We may use a little bit of European pills malt to get a little bit more um, kind of rich maltiness as opposed to the more neutral flavors uh, that you'd get from a North American one, say like a breeze or something. And uh, then we'll, we'll, add, we'll add, add to that uh, some multi character from some pretty pale colored malts for uh, maybe a little bit of Vienna, maybe a little bit of, uh, of um, caramel 10 or caramel 20 in pretty small amounts because we're not, we want to keep that color under about seven. Uh, we don't really want it going into amber territory because. Or apparently not red either. Yeah, definitely not red. I can definitely <laughs> think you don't want to do a red one of these things. And I can't even imagine what a black one might be like. It's perfect. <laughs> Uh, so you, you have to, the, so they'll look paler than they 
Uh, they will look darker than they really are, so you have to really be cautious about the color. So that means as a, in terms of recipe formulation, you have to be kind of clever about it, and you have to get to know your base malts pretty well uh, to be able to build a recipe without relying on uh, the, all that huge dose of flavor you might get from a 40 Love uh, caramel, for example. Nice. Um, well, I do want to get into the hop schedule now because uh, I know that that's one of the main topics we want to talk about is the biotransformations and what hops sure. to use, that kind of a thing. Yeah. So uh, you mentioned you use almost no boil hops, right? Just a little. You know, for home brewers, it'd be like five grams, maybe something five to ten grams. And how, uh, how are you splitting your uh, Whirlpool hops versus uh, dry hopping? You know, is it like 50-50 or? Uh, no, the... I think the whirlpool hopping would be probably on a level that would be in line with conventional um, pale ales. Let me see. Um, let me just look at my little recipe here. Uh, so maybe. Um, well, I mean, what know, what I be what bitterness level are you shooting for? Because that would define it, right? Well, you know, the thing is, yeah, I, I would with with your whirlpool hops, I would shoot for an IBU level somewhere around twenty five. So Which it's is, actually pretty low, really, for an IPA. It's really low. Yeah. It's really low. Um, and the, because, the original gravity, what were you saying the original gravity was? Well, it, uh, that would be for a single. Right. You know, it, maybe, yeah, for a single um, IPA. And then you can, you know, just ramp that up for a double, maybe half again as much for a double and double it for a triple. Um, you know, you're really trying to uh, just start to lay in some flavor there. The, we have found that if you, if you put the hops in for flavor, you're going to get bitterness to come along nicely. And the other things that they, the other thing that they've found, uh, there's been a lot of hop research recently. And one of the things that they've discovered with these high hop rates, uh, people are getting a fair amount of bitterness from, uh, things that are other than alpha acid bitterness. So they used to think, you know, you, you dry hop, you're really not getting any bitterness from it, but turns out really not to be true. So you get, um, there are some beta acids that solubilize uh, during dry hopping and they create a little bit of bitterness. And there's another group of uh, uh, chemicals uh, it's called chalcones, uh, chemicals like xanthohumol that have uh, pleasant uh, bitter characteristics. That, and when you're dry hopping at large amounts, you're going to be getting, uh, uh, you're getting pretty high amounts of, uh, uh, well, not high amounts of bitterness, but you're definitely picking up some bitterness. So if you aim for 30 BUs in the whirlpool, you may end up at 50 or so by the end. And, uh, because you're using you're using a very large amount of dry hops, right? And, and huge amount, like yeah. a stupid amount of dry hops. I mean, it really you look at the numbers and it's just like, man, this is crazy. You were mentioning how many po how many pounds per barrel was it? Uh, people can probably uh, convert we, it. Triple typically on a double, we'll do four to five. That's a lot. Uh, I six, and then on a triple, we've done eight. Eight pounds is, per barrel. Eight pounds per barrel. When I picture that, you know, that's a pile of hops. Uh, and, and of course, you, you know, you're going to get some loss. Um, you know, you've got, you got some loss. In I'm trying barrel. to think of barrels, 32 gallons, right? Or something like that. Uh, 31. Yeah. 31. So 30, yeah, 31. Yeah, divide by six more or less. Yeah. Wow. So that's over a, that would be the equivalent of over, over a pound of hops yeah. in a, in a, like a five gallon batch, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. That's insane. Just that, you know, it's just stupid, but that's what you got to do. <laughs> I mean, that's the that's the thing. That's why this style will never take over the world because it's too it's too expensive to make. Yeah, you're talking about a pound of, again, a pound of hops in a in a five gallon or 19 liter uh, batch, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, w one of the things speaking of, and that's just a dry hop. It's interesting. This is the first, as far as I know, this is the first real serious trend in craft brewing that wasn't initiated by home brewers. Hmm. Now it's possible that the people at uh, you know, um, up there in up there in Vermont, you know, um, we're homebrewing with this before they opened up uh, Alchemist, but uh, I'm not really sure. So, um, but well, I, I wanted to dive into the uh, bio transformation. So you're you're doing most of this dry hopping at High Krausen. Are you putting on all all the dry hops at that point? Uh, well, you're uh, no, you're you're not. You're doing about a a quarter to a third of the dry hops during during the um, um, during that high croissant. Yeah, peak, peak fermentation. Out. Yeah, and, and then the rest of it will go in, I mean, at our brewery, typically maybe on day four, day five, when when it's attenuated <laughs> out and the yeast is starting to slow down. Um, but still so, fairly early, uh, you're dry hopping, you know, basically right after fermentation is done, right? Pretty much, yeah. 
Yeah. And then and then uh, we, we've come back in the triples and we dry hopped a third time. Because mm -hmm. those beers go another week or so because they're higher gravity. I mean, they're coming out to 10 percent or so. Yeah. And so uh, by that by that time, your first hop dry hop charge, first and second high hop, dry hop charges are kind of losing their luster, you know, so you got to kind of pump them up with a little bit more. Um, the market likes these super fresh, you know, we've done some in, in as little as eight days and got them in the can. Um, you will find with those really short, uh, I mean, you got to have a really good fermentation. You really want a good, healthy yeast. You want to knock this thing out and like get it roaring and get it down to where you're going relatively rapidly. You don't want to, uh, do that through high temperature or anything, but, uh, just good yeast practices. I get that, um, get that fermentation done. Um, and, and, uh, you know, we've got them in the can within eight days. I think that's our quickest one ever. And, and what we found is that when you, at, at that point, you have a lot of what we call hot burn is a, uh, just a really like almost peppery kind of character character on your tongue that the hop, you can just, it's almost like your tongue is coated with hop resin. Uh, and it's really kind of peppery. Now we personally, don't think that's all that great a flavor, but I'll tell you that the people who, who come for those can releases, they love that, you know, that there's just this thirst out there for, for just super intensity of whatever it is. And they really love it. But more we, is better, we, right? Yeah. More is better. It's uh, <laughs> everything you know about it. need to know about America. You can get in spinal tap. Right? <laughs> uh, but um, yeah, so we like them about two weeks later that, that burn goes away. And they really settle down into something kind of magical, we think. So um, so what are we actually looking to get out of the biotransformation here? What are some of the unique flavors or, or compounds that you get out of it? Well, the, the bio, you know, hops have um, a whole bunch of uh, – let me see. Let me find my chart on this uh, so I get it correct. That's okay. Uh, hops, hops have um, – uh, hops have a lot of what are called terpenoid chemicals in them. So these are things that are found in all kinds of herbs and spices and in citrus fruits and a lot of other things. So they're, they're things that are familiar from other, other places. In particular, there's a, a, a chemical called geraniol that is, uh, as, it, as you might imagine from its name, it smells a bit like geranium. So it's usually what's described as that floral hop. Yeah, which that's is, an aromatic hop oil, right? I mean, you can... It's an aromatic yeah. hop compound right so the oil has hundreds of compounds but it is a specific uh, uh terpenoid and it has this sort of um, marigold like you think about a marigold or a geranium it's not a sweet floral like a rose it's more pungent and that's what's very high in uh, cascade for example and uh the other hop that's pretty high in it that we use a fair amount for that is mosaic because um mosaic also contains some of these um uh, sulfur compounds that are very, uh, very involved in uh, the fruity aromas and the tropical aromas, the passion fruit, the mango, the guava, those are all sulfur compounds. And so Cascade, you can dry hop with Cascade and get it to biotransform and that's okay, but you're not going to get any real fruitiness out, out of it because it just doesn't have those compounds in it. So that's why some of these newer varieties that have those, a little bit more of those sulfur compounds uh, you're going to get a little bit more tropical uh, notes, and so so because so it's an isomerization process, which means it's the it's the same atoms in the molecule, but just like just like alpha acids, uh, before the boil and after the boil, those same molecules are rearranged into a somewhat different shape. Maybe maybe they reverse the the you know just reverse direction, or they the uh, one side chain moves to a different part of the of the ring or something like that. So these are fairly simple transformations for the yeast to be able to make. And once you transform from little or from, uh, I'm sorry, from um, geraniol, one of the, let me get my chart. So I've got some notes here because this chemical is important. Okay. So, I mean, you're, you're, you've got an isomerization process going on, but not the same process that's going on, obviously with alpha acids, because we're, we're talking about geraniol here. It's the same. It's the same. It's the same chemical process, but it's different molecules. So, so you're rearranging these terpenoids through the action of the yeast. The main feed uh, molecule for that reaction appears to be geraniol. Now, there may be some other ones. This is still a very new area of science. So, uh, geraniol 
biotransforms into something called beta citronellol. So beta citronellol is a really clean, bright, lemony thing. So you're going from a kind of a dirty marigold floral kind of thing to this really bright beta citronellol. I think um, Citra has a fair amount of beta citronellol. I think that's probably responsible for its really lemony thing. Probably uh, um, Motueka. Yeah, because uh, the citronellol you're talking about is also another hop oil, right? Or it's another, another hop, aromatic yeah. hop oil, yeah. Yeah, these are all chemicals that are found in hops. They're, of course, right. they're found in lemons. They're found in coriander. They're found in all kinds of different things. And then also um, there's a pathway to get to a chemical called nerol. And nerol is uh, orange. Basically, if you've ever smelled orange blossom honey or orange blossoms themselves, like they use in Middle Eastern pastry, uh, nerol is a uh, uh, basically a uh, orange blossom oil. So it has this nice. really perfumey, sweet, uh, orangey kind of thing that blends in really nicely with other citrus aromas and other fruity aromas. And then finally, a chemical called linalool, uh, which is an orangey compound. And the orangey, this lin orangey linalool uh, has, uh, is, is found in coriander. So if you, if you think about the smell of coriander and n you know, know that it has this sort of uh, citrusy kind of characteristic to it, that citrusy compound is really from uh, the uh, linalool primarily. And then there's another chemical called uh, alpha terpeniol that smells like lilac or pine or bay leaf. So it's a little more evergreen, a little uh, darker kind of aromas. Uh, there's another one called citronellol acetate that gets into kind of pear or honey or sort of fresh green flavors. So, um, you know, you're, you're basically... Uh, taking an undesirable chemical, getting rid of it, and substituting some much more desirable chemicals for it. So that seems to be uh, the, be the primary benefit of doing that active, uh, fermenta active dry hopping during fermentation. And of course, the side benefit is it gets you that haze that's kind of hard to get uh, in any other way. Well, obviously, you get a lot of haze from the proteins for the, from the grain bill you're using too, but yeah. Yeah, it's not the same extent. I mean, no. if you really want to make one that has that juicy look, you got to do that biotransformation. Um, well, where uh, so you, the biotransformation contributes to haze. Obviously, the protein contributes to haze. Um, where do you get the the milkshake milkshake like flavors? I guess, or where do you get all those? Is it just a combination of all these things happening? Yeah, yeah, it really is this intense fruitiness, this lack of a really strong bitterness, the uh, use of water minerals that tend to produce a round, soft, creamy flavor rather than a sharp crisp, uh, refreshing one. Uh, then again, high amounts of uh, oats, of wheat, of rye. We've Our typical recipes use about 50% adjuncts. So you're right up, you're basically, these are hoppy wit beers in some regards. You know, <laughs> so in terms of your grist formulation, if you go to straight up uh, a wit beer recipe, 45% flaked oats, 50% unmalted barley, um, uh, 5% oats, that'll get you pretty nice. You may want to add a little bit of color in there, uh, a little malty flavor from caramel 10 or 20, or maybe a little bit of uh, Vienna, something like that, to uh, just add a little rich maltiness to help with balance and give it a little bit more color. Uh, but, uh, you know, oats work great. Uh, we've done one with 35 or 30% 30 rye. Uh, so that rye works nicely and it adds a little bit of a, a sort of, you know, white rye has, it's always described as being spicy. For me, it's like maybe like a spiced cherry. You know, there's a fruitiness, I think, that rye brings, which I think is also really nice with uh, to add to the hops. So rye's been a pretty nice addition, um, and people like that one pretty well. And obviously, um, obviously, you don't age these very long. You can try and get them out the door right away, right? And uh, I assume they don't have a long shelf life either, right? Uh, you know, we've had some that are two months old, and we think they're perfectly palatable, you know, for, for – um, uh, packaging the devil's in the details. It's really yeah. about how good your canner is and and uh, um, or bottler, excluding that air. Um, uh, but and and also, I will say because they don't have a lot of crystal malts, they age a little more gracefully than would a typical kind of old school he crystal heavy pale or IPA. Yeah. Uh, so, so you don't have that sort of leathery um, kind of you know stale paper and leathery kind of uh, aromas uh, quite so much. Um, well, much ugly really hardly any of that especially that leathery thing that crystal malt flavor so so they hold up well but the you know the geeks really like them super fresh they come to the brewery they take you know we'll we'll 
tell them, we put the word out when the, when the beer's ready, people come and they get the beer and they go home and that's it. You know, they drink it and it's gone and they wait for the next one a few weeks later. So, um, they really, it's, it's interesting because just a few years ago, people were buying beers and just hoarding them and, uh, they would hang on to them for years and years and years and let them go bad in their basement rather than try and find that time to drink them. So it's kind of fun, fun to see that we've got a style now that people think should be drunk like that day. Um, again, I think they're a little overheated on that too. Uh, they hold up well for, for a matter of a few weeks. Um, even though they may lose a little bit of that really super, 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 super fresh raw hop flavor. Um, you know, in our minds, they're actually a little bit better after a couple of weeks yeah. and then they fade out a bit. But, um, so I think it's a bit of a myth as to how fresh they have to be. But of course, you know, different breweries ability to can or bottle, well, um, you know, in terms of excluding oxygen, it varies a lot. So it's really a brewery by brewery thing. Well, I want to give you a moment to talk about some of the variants. I think there's like uh, milkshake IPAs, oaked IPAs, uh, other variants of the Northeast, or New England style, I should say. Yeah, we did one with oak. Um, we, we used an oak that was specifically toasted to create a lot of, um, of uh, vanillin, which is the chemical that you get when you trans, when you basically, when you, uh, um, um, put oak in contact with things like whiskey, uh, you get uh, the woody, lignin, gluey, resiny component of wood uh, degrades and changes chemically into something called vanillin, which is the main sweet uh, vanilla type of uh, chemical that's found in, in vanilla. And so uh, the, the interesting thing is, is that when you, if you were to wait to the end of the fermentation and conditioning, when this, which is when normally people would drop oak chips into a beer, the beer just tastes like oak. But mm -hmm. we found, and I... This is a secret I picked up from a brewery in Australia a few years ago, that if you add that oak to right when fermentation begins, so, so again, you're, you're going through who knows what the yeast is doing to it. I'm not sure I could technically call it biotransformation, but there's definitely something going on when you put the oak through fermentation. It, that reaction to create vanillin happens much, much more quickly. And so, they do that They do that in winemaking, actually. It's very common. Yeah, I know, they put them, I know they put chips in fermentation. They put them in. They put them in. Wine, uh, oak powder as well, I think. Yeah, the, the, the wineries are much more sophisticated about their use of the chips than the home brewers are. But what we ended up using was a fairly darkly toasted, I mean, it was really light brown color of an American oak chip, which wouldn't have been our first choice, except we bought it from a company that sells to wineries. And this was a, a chip that was specifically toasted to create a high amount of vanillin. And that's the flavor we really wanted out of that. And what we found in the beer was that... Uh, it really added a, an extra luscious kind of creaminess because, you know, vanilla itself just adds a really nice, round, soft, creamy perception of sweet. You know, it's not sweet, but it's so associated with sweet that when you smell vanilla, your brain is going into sweet mode. So it enhances the sweetness of the of the beer for that reason, uh, even though it doesn't actually enhance the real tongue sweetness. But it's a perceived thing that's definitely real for sure. And then I guess, you know, there's a lot of this this field is still really pretty hot um we're we're one of a, a handful of breweries in chicago that are that have started to establish a reputation for doing these uh there's you know i think people are starting to fool with them but i think there's start, still a lot of breweries that think yeah this is just nonsense it's going to go away it's just a fad it's just like black ipa we're not going to go down that road um i think it's here to stay but like i said it's never going to take over the world but the hottest thing going right now are sour versions of these IPAs, which are basically just pretty much the same recipe, but done with a kettle sour and possibly with the addition of more fruit. So, pick so you fruit. kettle, kettle sour at first and then, and then ferment. Now, uh, and then, uh, I assume you're still adding the hops during high krausen. Yeah. So the whole, everything's, everything else is the same. And for people who aren't familiar, uh, the kettle souring process is a, is a sort of an in, interesting and very convenient, uh, shortcut to getting a sour beer without ruining your brewery. So the typical procedure would be to mash to mash in and run off and get all your runoff and then bring it up to pasteurization temperature, say about 150 degrees, hold that for a few minutes, and then let it cool to the point where you can inoc inoculate it with a, a lambic culture, or a lot of people are using probiotic uh, cultures because they're inexpensive and there's a lot of different ones of them. And uh, then uh, carefully, uh, putting a blanket of CO2 on it and 
trying to your best to exclude the oxygen and maintain the temperature at whatever temperature that that uh, lactobacillus likes to live at sort of yogurt temperatures like i think around 110 or so mm -hmm. uh, because at lower temperatures and with more oxygen it will create a lot of butyric acid which will give you sort of uh barfy kind of uh really yeah that's the baby diaper flavor we all love uh, yeah that baby poop uh, baby yeah baby barf kind of things not nice um and um so there are, you can actually culture too i know there was a brewery down in new zealand who is sort of building up their own culture so they're taking some malt and inoculating it and then culturing that and uh and then growing that up finding you know finding one that they like and then growing that up to use as a pitch to create a uh, uh, a kettle sour thing, and you typically let those go somewhere in the neighborhood of eighteen to twenty to twenty four possibly hours, and uh, generally people just sort of go by taste um, or and or pH on them. You have to be careful if they're too sour; you'll start to um, start to uh, hurt your yeast and fermentation. So you don't want to yeah. blow out probably I don't know three seven three eight something like that. Uh, yeah, I always watch the pH levels. You don't want to get, uh, well, I know once pH drops, you know, pH drops once you start fermenting, but anytime when the fermenting pH gets below three, you're in trouble usually. Yeah, three is definitely trouble. So. Well, that's, that's, that's after it's already, after, like I said, it yeah. drops once you pitch the yeast, it drops quite yeah. a bit. So you got, if you monitor it during fermentation, you don't want to let it go below three. Yeah, absolutely. You know, if you want it super sour, just hold, you know, just do a little, do the kettle sour and come back in with a little lactic or phosphoric yeah. or something at the end. You know, it's technically it's cheating, but, but, uh, those, those, you know, produce, that'll get you the, your acidity and it won't screw up your yeast. So, nice. uh, and then finally there's a, a style that's really emerging called milkshake IPAs. It sort of takes it in the other direction to New England, uh, with, uh, uh, you could use oak in it and get a little vanilla that way, or just dump in some vanilla. They're typically uh, done with uh, uh, some spices, uh, like sweet spices. You could do an orange sickle version with some, some vanilla that gets you that orange Julius kind of thing, or a, a sweet cherry one, or uh, we've got a blackberry one in the tanks right now. Uh, they typically use a fair amount of lactose, maybe 20, 25% of lactose in the recipe, which is a very large amount of lactose. But, but the idea with those is that they really have this sweetness. In yeah, that's a, that's a huge amount of lactose, actually. Crazy amount of lactose, yeah. I mean, we, for our own taste, it's a little much, but I'm yeah. telling you, these things are red hot out of the market. So, nice. you know, the way it goes. Well, Randy, um, unfortunately, we're running out of time, but I'd love to have you back at some point in the future. Maybe talk some more about biotransformation and hops. I know you've got a lot of detail there that uh, we didn't get to today, but I wanted to thank you again for coming on the show. Thanks again, Randy. Yeah, sure, Brad. Always a pleasure. Look forward to the next time. And again, uh, my guest today was Randy Mosher. Randy is the author of uh, Mastering Home. I'm put on his website here. Uh, Mastering Homebrew, uh, Radical Brewing, Tasting Beer. Uh, he's also an instructor at the uh, Siebel Institute. And I wanted to plug his website uh, at randymosher.com. Thanks again, Randy. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Brad. We'll see you. Well, a big thank you to Randy Mosher for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue is packed with great information for homebrewers and craft beer fans. Take advantage of their fantastic sale and get 20% off the magazine when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2018 at beerandbrewing.com. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the new BrewVision wireless thermometer. Remotely monitor your brewing system from your iPhone or iPad, record data, set alerts, and grab recipes directly from the BeerSmith cloud. The BrewVision thermometer, another great innovation from Blickman Engineering, Dot com. And finally, Beersmith Mobile. The mobile version of Beersmith is a perfect complement to our desktop brewing software. Check out Beersmith Mobile at beersmith.com slash mobile or on the Google Play, iTunes, or Amazon app stores. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm -hmm.